Challenging King, Democrat Jim Maurer pursuing a goal that six previous candidates have missed, defeating Republican Steve King's bid to represent Northwest Iowa in the U.S. House of Representatives. During the next hour, Maurer and King debating campaign issues in a special edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Iowa banks know you want honest advice about how to best reach your financial goals, whether it's financing and education, buying a new home, growing a business, or funding retirement. Iowa banks, Iowa values. MyIowaBank.com. The Rotary Clubs of Iowa and Rotary International. In 1985, Rotary International committed to a goal of ending polio worldwide. Very soon now, after immunizing over 2 billion children, the goal will be achieved. Rotary, humanity in motion. Alliant Energy, working to help Iowa small businesses become more profitable with energy efficient heating, cooling, lighting, and more. Information is available at AlliantEnergy.com. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network, the ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa public television. Live from the campus of Buena Vista University, this is a special debate edition of Iowa Press. Here is Dean Boyd. Welcome to Buena Vista University's Anderson Auditorium. We're now in Iowa's fourth congressional district. That's the state's northwestern counties by and large, but including a region from Ames to Sibley and Mason City and New Hampton, westward to Denison and Sioux City. 39 of Iowa's 99 counties. Republican Steve King from Chiron is the incumbent here, first elected in 2002 seeking a seventh term. Although the region's congressional boundaries change, of course, with redistricting every 10 years, Republicans have represented some counties in what is now the 4th District since the mid-1960s. Democrat Jim Maurer from Boone is campaigning to change that. He's an Iowa National Guard, a rock veteran, also served as a civilian in political appointments at the Pentagon. Congressman King, Mr. Maurer, welcome to Iowa Press. And uh, I, I must say, and you can tell, I, I feel like I'm masquerading here in another body, but this is me, and, uh, but not my voice. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, we'll get through it together. Thank you, Dean. Well, you're both familiar with our traditional Iowa Press format, but we are in a different setting here in Storm Lake with a live audience, in addition to our television viewers. And, those here in the audience have agreed not to cheer during this one-hour debate. We're following our regular Iowa Press format with which you're familiar, and that is no preset debate rules, just an exchange of ideas and issues. I'll be moderating, and questions will be coming from political journalists, Des Moines Register columnist Kathy Obradovich, and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Congressman King, 12 years as you seek re-election for two more, what do you point to as your signature accomplishment in Congress? You know, Ronald Reagan once said that it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. But I think some of those accomplishments come down to the bad ideas that have been killed or stalled. And I think one would recognize that my fight against Obamacare, I don't know if there's anyone that's fought it more strongly than I have, but we did in the middle of all of this gridlock, we passed a good farm bill. And that's something that will be there for the next five years or longer. 
and we have seen the foundation of our agriculture here in, in Iowa be stronger because of a good risk management program that exists in this new farm bill too and we've seen capital increase in the time I've been in Congress just in the value of the dirt over two hundred billion dollars net asset appreciation in the value of farmland that doesn't include property plant equipment cash in the bank grain in the bin uh, collectors items and whatever so we made a lot of progress in agriculture and I've enjoyed the support of all of the major ag groups in this campaign and in the previous one Mr. Maurer this district has a Republican voter registration edge if you would be elected to Congress you would most likely be part of a minority what's your argument to voters of how you would be an effective representative for this district if elected well, you know, I think right now in Congress, the one thing that I hear the most when I travel throughout the 39 counties here in the 4th District is people understand that Congress is broken. It's not getting the job done. And we, and we have a representative who has a record of never working with anyone across the aisle to get the job done. We need to send more representatives who have a record of pragmatic results who want to get Congress moving again. My opponent has no record. I point that out. I have a record of serving my country. I have a record of saving taxpayers billions of dollars at the Pentagon, and that's the record that I would bring to Congress. Well, you have a look on your face as if you don't believe that. Well, I've heard a lot of things I don't believe here during this campaign, and that would be one of them. Uh, the, the statement that my opponent has established the Army Office of Business Transformation, I recall how it was established. I, I voted for that in 2008. It passed the House of Representatives on May 22nd. It passed the Senate and was signed into law October 22nd of 2008. The gentleman arrived in the Pentagon in, in January, or actually early February of 2010. So the establishment of the Army of Office, Office, of, Office of Business Transformation was done by Congress at the hand of John McHugh, who is now the Secretary of the Army. And I served with John McHugh. Go ahead. Well, I, I served under Secretary McHugh and the Under Secretary of the Army uh, and the Chief Management Officer of the Army. When I entered the Pentagon, I was tasked by the Chief Management Officer of the Army to oversee standing up the Army Office of Business Transformation, which was established in law. And so I worked closely uh, with Secretary McHugh, who is a former Republican Congressman from New York. Mr. King, or Congressman King, I also heard said it's never accomplished anything by working across the aisle. Do you dispute that, or is that true? Because you, you are an outlier. Uh, you are uh, a person who says things that are outside the traditional Republican line. First thing I would say, if we're going to use the term outlier, we ought to refer people to the book on outliers and what that really means. That means somebody that sets a trend. That's somebody that actually may not fit the statistical standard, but also is a leader. And if you talk about working across the aisle, that's how we got a farm bill done. And that was my job, reaching across the aisle. And that's why we were able to get a bipartisan vote. And in the end, we got a good farm bill that was bipartisan and had bipartisan support. I was engaged in all of that, and I've been engaged in it for three and a half years just to get to that point. Gentlemen, here in Storm Lake, uh, this is the, set, the county seat of the most racially diverse county in the state of Iowa. Um, the register reported recently that 80% uh, of the kids in school are non-white and 18 languages are spoken uh, in the school district here. Congressman King, uh, you fought uh, during your career and also uh, after you left the state senate to make English the official language of Iowa. Um, do you think that the diversity that we're seeing here and that we may be seeing in a lot more of Iowa in years to come is something to be embraced or something to be resisted? And how would you support that in Congress? I think if, if one looks back on my record, we succeeded in establishing English as the official language of the state of Iowa. And I'm the lead sponsor of English as the official language of legislation in the United States Congress. When that moment comes, we have the opportunity to pass that legislation. I'm hopeful we'll be able to move that through because a common language is the most powerful unifying force known to humanity throughout all history. It, it, is, a, it is a common language, it is a language of success and achievement. I just congratulated a young man back in actually the restroom who was an American citizen who arrived here from Somalia. I have been a great cheerleader for legal immigration and I congratulate all people that are here, citizens of choice who respect our laws. It's very interesting to hear the congressman speak this way because I think we're used to him using very hateful and divisive language uh, when talking about immigration. Uh, he is not leading, he doesn't have any plans to fix our broken immigration system. And frankly, every time I hear him, which is very often, use this hateful and divisive language to talk about immigration, I think of a friend of mine that I served with in Iraq who was not an American citizen, 
who actually received his citizenship in Iraq. And so that's not the right leadership. Congressman Clean King claims to be leading in Congress, but I think if he would turn around for a moment, he'd see no one's following. Let me, let me have you define hateful language. Well, again, I think most people have heard Congressman King's uh, language uh, talking about immigrants. Uh, they've received national press. Uh, that doesn't move our, our conversation forward. We have a broken immigration system in this country. Uh, I support the comprehensive immigration reform bill that passed the United States Senate. It would put an additional 20,000 boots on the border. It's supported by the Farm Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and it would cut a trillion dollars from our deficit over the coming decades. Congressman King doesn't have any plans to fix our immigration system. He just has empty rhetoric. No plans? Well, of course, there wasn't an answer to your question, I'd point out, Dean, but it's pretty clear. It's not the system that's broken. It's the administration that refuses to enforce existing law that we have. However, I have brought a number of pieces of legislation forward that improve this system that we have. You have to have the will to enforce the law before you're going to have an effective immigration system. I'm for building a fence, a wall, and a fence along our southern border. Not a full 2,000 miles, just build it till they stop going around the end. I'm the author of the most important piece of legislation we could pass, and I generated the idea and wrote the bill. It's called the New Idea Act, the New Illegal Deduction Elimination Act, which eliminates the federal tax deductibility for wages and benefits that are paid to illegals. That shuts down the jobs magnet, and that helps us secure our borders. These are ideas that all Republican candidates have endorsed in the last presidential election. We'll see if they will here in Iowa in even, the next one. Even Governor Perry of Texas has said that building a wall is not the right approach and that people that advocate, it, advocate for it don't understand the challenges that we face. Um, and this is, frankly, a 20th century uh, solution to a 21st century problem. Well, walls before, work. That's why they're around the White House. Boots on the border work. Before, before, we, go, before we go on from immigration, Mr. Maurer, um, there are challenges that come from uh, all the diversity that we have in communities like Storm Lake. Um, what, you're embracing uh, perhaps a, a, a freer flow of, of immigrants into the United States. How would you, how would you help communities like Storm Lake to uh, address some of the issues like challenges in schools, challenges with social services? Well, we're, again, we're a country of immigrants, and that's why we need comprehensive immigration reform to help fix this broken system. Uh, helping people integrate into communities is a big piece of that. The difference is I've read the bill. The Gang of Eights bill, it's referred to as Comprehensive Immigration Reform, does dump a lot of money down into the border, but it doesn't secure it. It lowers the standard. Right now we have a, at least a legal standard of 100%. This lowers it to 90. It is perpetual, instantaneous, and retroactive amnesty. It destroys the rule of law, and we cannot be a country if we're not going to have a border and if we're not going to have a rule of law. No one is proposing amnesty. Obviously, Congressman King is mischaracterizing the bill, or he hasn't read it. Uh, I have for someone it. who has advocated for the English as the official language has never looked up the definition of amnesty. I will give you the definition of amnesty. To grant amnesty is to pardon immigration lawbreakers and reward them with the objective of their crime. That's, and that's amnesty not in the and, that's and that's what not, the no bill one is does and I have read the bill. The gentleman has not. How do you define amnesty? Well, this is a the immigration reform bill that passed the United States Senate, again with an overwhelming bipartisan majority. Uh, provides for a decade-plus corrective process that includes paying a fine and meeting a whole host of requirements. That's not amnesty. Amnesty would be free and clear. And again, Congressman King's mischaracterizing the bill. Congressman King, last word on this on amnesty. Well, it's pretty simple. If you're going to lower or eliminate the penalties for breaking the law, that's amnesty. You don't get to change the rules after the game. All right. Okay. Uh, Congressman King, you worked on the farm bill, as you mentioned earlier. Um, if you get, as you wish, a bigger Republican majority in the House and a re Republican majority in the Senate, when you go to write the next farm bill, should um, Iowa farmers start planning for no federal supports? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I've been a strong advocate for a stable farm bill. And that means, remember, 80% of this goes off to the food stamp side and the nutrition side. But we're talking about the 20% of the resources right. that go into, the, into agriculture. That means a good risk management program. And the heart and the core of that needs to be a good federal crop insurance program. That's the stability that we've got to have. And we need to have equity in there so that Iowa farmers are paying premiums that reflect the risk they're taking, along with those folks in Texas, Florida, and some of the other states that are getting a far better return on their premium dollars. So that's where I'd look for some of the adjustments in the next farm bill. But we cannot, we've got to have a farm bill 
because simply this, we cannot afford to have all of our farmers go broke in the same year. Let me put no, it what do you this. Put, go ahead, Kate. But what do you say to Republicans in your own party who say we don't want to pay farmers? Well, I said way. enough to sell them on this one. So, uh, you know, it, you, you deal with the circumstances then, and we're five years down the road. But I would say to our farmers that are listening tonight that we asked for their advice three and four years ago. Things were going good enough. It was hard to get their advice then. When we got closer, we got more advice. So hard times will give you more advice. Let's take notes all the way through. Shape it with the input of all of our ag groups. That's how I've gotten the support of all of our ag groups, by working with every one of them, all 60 actually 60 to nothing was the score in the last election. Mr. Maurer, uh, why should a small businessman who's a farmer get subsidies from the government whereas a small businessman who's on Main Street does not? Because agriculture and feeding the world is a priority. We can't do anything without it. Uh, it is a foundational issue. Agriculture is the foundation to our economy, to the world's economy. Uh, and we can't do anything without it. And to hear Congressman King's characterization of his work on the Farm Bill uh, sounds like he single-handedly got it passed. Uh, when in fact, the Senate passed an overwhelmingly bipartisan Farm Bill, went to the House, was massively delayed because Congressman King uh, was obstructing uh, its passage, and then when it finally did pass the House after it had been stripped out, Republican Senator Grassley refused to vote for it because the House and Congressman King's work That's had done so much damage to Let it. Let me put it to this way, Mr. King. Um, Driving to Storm Lake late last night after dark, I could look for miles out in this largely agricultural area of Iowa. And there's the lights of the harvesters were out there during the night harvesting. And it came to me that this is Iowa's greenery, if not a large section of the Midwest's greenery. The emphasis here is on grain farming. Just recently, I was speaking with uh, some bankers and farm lenders who are bemoaning the fact that the price of corn right now, that corn that was being harvested as, as I drove along last night, is about half of what it was a year ago. They were predicting and anticipating that there's a, a great economic fall ahead for Iowa's farmers and Midwest farmers and saying that this time it isn't going to be the bankers and farmers that take the hit, it's going to be farmers by themselves who are over leveraged right now themselves and that agricultural communities are going to be even further decimated. That is the countryside of the 4th Congressional District. If that occurs, and it could within the next 12 to 18 months, what are you prepared to do if you're reelected to Congress what are you prepared to do to mitigate and to assist Iowa's rural communities, not just farmers, but Iowa's rural communities from taking that economic hit? Well, Dean, that was a grim question. Um, but I have to say before I respond to that, that my opponent's previous statement was completely baseless. And if you check my votes, you'd know that. Uh, second, though, with this, I have lived through this. I've lived through the farm crisis of the 80s. I know what it's like to pay 22% interest, and I know what it's like when the FDIC comes in and locks the bank up at Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, April 26, 1985. I had two pennies in my pocket to rub together in a payroll to meet, and my customers' accounts were frozen along with mine. I have been through that. I remember seeing $26 billion get dumped into the farm, to the farm program in about 1985, and I remember seeing 14 new pickups parked at the restaurant there after that, and mine was the only one that wasn't. Uh, so I have been through this. We're in a lot better shape than we were in back in the 80s. A lot of that land was leveraged. A lot of the land we have today is paid for. The $200 billion in net asset value of ag land that I mentioned earlier in this, that's the capital that will help bridge us through. And we will adjust the programs like we do. If there is a drought or a disaster, we sit down and figure out how to deal with it. And, and I have sat there and done that as well, dealing with droughts in places like western Nebraska. If we have that crisis, but more, corn was up today, beans are up today, so there's reason to be optimistic. Are you saying you are optimistic and that we have in federal law right now the safety nets? We have a safety net. We have a safety net built in there now, and we never know if that's going to be enough. 
And if Congress has to step in and supplement this in some way, I will hear from our producers, and if it's acute, we'll convene a way to address it. Mr. Maurer, you heard the premise of my question. If you're elected to Congress, what are you prepared to do if that dire prediction comes true? I am prepared to be a tireless advocate for Iowa and the 4th District and for farmers. I grew up uh, on a farm here but in doing Iowa. doing uh, Well, again, by working with Democrats and Republicans to get the job done. Unfortunately, uh, Congressman King, who's been in Congress for 12 years, 12 years, if he had not pursued a national selfish Tea Party agenda, would be next in line to be chair of the Agriculture Committee, which would put him in a great position to advocate for Iowa farmers. Instead, Congressman Conaway from Texas is going to be the next chair of the Agricultural Committee, and he is someone who just days ago said he was against the renewable fuel standard, that we needed to lower it, and farmers were going to have to take a hit. Since I went to Congress, there has never been a better 12 years to be a farmer in Iowa are an Iowan living in Iowa. But Those you can't are the take facts. credit for that. I'm, I'm telling these are, these, these are the facts of what we're dealing with. That's what I'm talking about. The asset values are there. And I'm the guy that has long said, no, I said it earlier today. It, it, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Well, it's, it may be great to be a farmer right now, but and yet farmers are still complaining about some things, including regulations um, dealing with the environment. Um, what what uh, do you think is, is there, first of all, an appropriate level of federal regulation um, dealing with farmers uh, to ensure clean air and clean water? Well, there was, and that's to me. Um, there have been better times to be a farmer than this year. I'll make that point. And the NASR markets, as Dean said, they dropped more than 50 percent. Corn's dropped off 60 percent from where it was at the highs. Um, but what do we do with the EPA and what do we do with their overreach, in particular the waters of the United States and the regulations they've written that says uh, if it's a significant nexus with the waters of the United States, the EPA can come and regulate. That means they can regulate everything all the way up to and maybe including the kitchen sink. And we can't have a federal government that's going to change the rules. Now it requires, under their rule, permission to do normal farming practices rather than prohibition on certain farming practices. My question, though, is about I, what, is there a, an appropriate level of regulation from the federal government, or do you want them out altogether? And, there, and if so... Kathy, then how do you ensure clean that there air is an water? appropriate level and 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 there was a time when we needed the clean water act the clean air act and the endangered species act i think and we the, don't need them now I, th I think we need them now but i think the epa in particular has overreached and so there are times when congress has to step in and that's one of the reasons that I have introduced reg legislation called the Sunset Act, which incrementally over 10 years, 10 percent a year, brings all of the regulations from all of the agencies before Congress for an up or down vote. So we have a voice back on it again and make Congress take the responsibility for that executive branch decision, not, not, the, not the regulators. And, and Mr. Maurer, are there areas right now where you see uh, the federal government over-regulating farmers? And secondly, um, how do you feel about the level of oversight on cities right now, especially runoff from uh, fertilizer on lawns and also uh, wastewater treatment plants? Well, there's some, there's some things in, in the EPA we need to cut through the red tape, some permitting process, et cetera. But conservation is important. We need to ensure uh, that our children and grandchildren can continue to farm the same land and feed the future. Uh, Congressman King stated again that he doesn't care who gets the credit. He'll state that he's proposed legislation. And the reason he says these things is because after 12 years in Congress, he's never passed any real legislation. He's never brought anything to Iowa. He's not getting the job done. And so again, he'll say he's proposed things. Uh, he, he's worked with people. He doesn't care who gets the credit. And that's because he's, he'll never be the one to get the credit. And Mr. King? This is, gets really tiresome. You know, it's really tiresome. <laughs> Uh, the very well, first, the, the, just let me talk. The very first bill I introduced in Congress established a, the credit for small ethanol producers, and that became law. There was also a provision in there that enhanced biodiesel production. That became law in 1985, and, they, and, and so I thought it was going to be easy. It's not that easy. You put your name on a bill, Nancy Pelosi sees it. She doesn't want to see that go any further. So what I've done instead is I've brought amendments to the floor of Congress. And of the people that have brought amendments, there are only two that have offered more. 
and that would be Jeff Flake and Sheila Jackson Lee. In fact, I think that changed. I think it's now Jeff Flake has gone to the Senate, but I believe I'm still third in the most amendments offered, and I'm number one in the most that have been passed. Now, that'll tell you something. When you put judgment out on the floor <laughs> and require people to vote on whether they agree with me or not, I have the highest per percentage of, of success on amendments in the United States House of Representatives, and there are only two that have offered more than I have. That's simply not true, because Senator Flake has even asked Congressman King to stop citing that because it's false. He hasn't asked me, and I'm the guy you'd have to ask to find out if that were stop true. Referencing that. And again, claiming that, that amendments and, and, and uh, proposing legislation is action just isn't true. Well, gentlemen, we go back and forth, and uh, we're going to let you answer something that the other is saying. Like most other campaigns, you've both been using television advertising to tell voters some things you believe they should know about your opponent. We have a couple of examples here. Mr. King, first a commercial that you're airing. In Iowa, we tell it like it is. I've been telling Washington over and over and rather loudly about threats building outside our country because they've ignored border security and financial threats from within due to Obamacare and our stifling debt. On the other hand, my opponents for amnesty, for Obamacare and for Nancy Pelosi. And that's telling it like it is. Mr. Bauer, um that's talking about you. It is. Now, that's something Mr. King wants viewers to know about you. Well, it's blatantly false. I am glad that he used some good pictures of me. Uh, but uh, it, it, the claims made in that ad are simply false. Of course, he doesn't cite anything. Uh, he claims that I support Nancy Pelosi, which I do not. Uh, he claims that I support the Affordable Care Act, uh, which I've publicly stated I've got a lot of problems with. And again, he claims I support amnesty, which no one has proposes. So again, he doesn't understand the definition of amnesty. And that ad is trying to scare people. It's, he's trying to invoke fear in people. He cites that there's a, somehow a threat on the border from Ebola and ISIS. That's simply not true. There's no evidence to support that. Uh, but again, um, this is something where Congressman King is using fear as a tool. He's scared of the future. He wants voters to be scared of the future as well Congress, so that they'll vote for him. Congressman King, we know Halloween is right around the corner trying to scare people. Let me say this. I think I've heard my opponent say that if he happened to be elected to Congress that he would vote against Nancy Pelosi. Uh, I think I heard him say that he doesn't support Obamacare, uh, except he'd like, to, he'd like to change. I think he said that I don't understand what the definition of amnesty is. I'll leave that to the voters. I defined amnesty. It's out there and it's clear. All right. Now, Mr. Maurer, there's a commercial that your campaign is airing and it's about Congressman Steve King. Let's take a look at that. Elections are about choices, and when we needed him, Jim Maurer put the country first and served in Iraq. But in Washington, Steve King put himself and his party first and shut our government down. Jim Maurer wants to raise the minimum wage. Steve King doesn't. But he did vote to raise his own pay by $20,000 a year and take perks like free health care for life. Those are their choices. What will yours be? I'm Jim Maurer, and I approve this message. Congressman King, Jim Maurer takes credit for that. You just heard I approve this message. You asked him to remove that from the airwaves. In fact, even saying you weren't even going to sit beside him at this debate uh, be, if he wouldn't take it off the air. I'd ask people to go see the website MaurerLiza.com. And there's a lot of answers <laughs> in that website that are there. Uh, but first of all, no member of Congress that I know of gets free health care for life. None. And no member of Congress while I was there had an opportunity to vote for free health care for life. No member of Congress had an opportunity to vote on a raise while I was there. I had one opportunity to freeze my pay. I did that. My pay has been frozen since 2009. There were only cost of living adjustments that were there. They were put in law in 1989. So there were times when we had an opportunity to vote to freeze it. I did that when I had a clear standalone vote. When it was cluttered with $410 billion in an irresponsible spending and it was put in there in order to be a trick vote, then I voted against the $410 billion of spending. There And the $20,000, it's an allegation that's there. If you do the calculation on his rationale, it comes to $2,610, not $20,000. And my pay, again, has been frozen since 2009. So many of those statements are completely, blatantly fabricated from thin air, false. Mr. Maury, when he asked you to take down that ad, why didn't you? Uh, well, I laughed out loud first, of course, because these are true ads. These are real votes that Congressman King, King took. And he can defend those votes and say, uh, you know, he voted for or against them for another reason. 
But you can go to my website, jimforiowa.com, uh, to see these votes cited. But he voted to allow his pay to be raised by $20,000. And during that same time, 300,000 working Iowans working on minimum wage only make $15,000 a year. That's the hypocrisy that my ad points out. And he doesn't dispute the fact uh, that he opposes the minimum wage uh, while, uh, again, voting for these perks. In 2009, for example, uh, he voted for a bill to raise his own pay that only 24 members of Congress voted for. The vote was 398 to 24. The Des Moines Register uh, reported on that, uh, that vote as well. That was 21 Republicans that voted no on that, the most conservative ones, and it was not a vote to raise the pay. It was, a, it was a, an amendment that went into the rule the night before, and the last minute there was no opportunity to offer amendments. They usurped the rules. It was $410 billion in irresponsible Nancy Pelosi spending, and everybody knows that's what I voted against. But $20,000 does not equate into $2,610. He just and, admitted to taking the vote. Let's go on to Kay. Congressman, in one of your ads, you say, I ruffle feathers. What's the value for Iowans in, in your ability to ruffle feathers? Well, I think if you could go to Washington and go along to get along, that's the problem with people in Washington. Some of us have stood on principle, and I think that that is, a, is an absolutely clear, clear record. And people come to me continually across this district, all 39 counties, and I've been to all 382 towns, and they say, stand your ground, keep doing what you're doing. We need more Iowa values in Washington, D.C., not less. These values are the heart of the heartland are what are going to save America. And we need the voices of everybody out here coming together. They come to me and they say, what do they think in Iowa? Because they know if we can hold it together here in Iowa, we can hold our country together. If we fail here in Iowa, our country falls apart. Mr. Maurer, um, in regards to the Ebola outbreak, there have been Democrats in other races who have embraced the idea of at least considering a travel ban. Is that something that you would countenance for people coming into the U.S. from the three African countries where the outbreak is centered? I, I think that all options should be on the table, but from what I'm hearing from medical experts and travel experts is that's not the right approach. Uh, we need to confront this outbreak in a calm, concise, deliberate way. We need to stop it from spreading here in the United States. We need to confront it at the source in Africa. Uh, and again, that's how we need to react. But Congressman King, again, has a TV ad up on the air telling people that they should be afraid, that they should panic. That's not what real leadership is. This country is the greatest nation on earth because we've been willing to react calmly and deliberately. And I'm not afraid. That's why I joined the military. After the September 11th attacks, President Bush told us we should not be afraid. And so I joined our military. I've never been afraid. The American people should not be afraid because we have a bright future. Mr. King, last week you said that the president's order to send U.S. troops into those three countries in, in Africa was not something you would support. You think the soldiers should volunteer for that. Why? Well, I, made, I laid out eight points on how we deal with Ebola. That was one of them. I don't believe that they should be, in, be ordered into face an unseen uh, enemy that we don't understand, the silent killer of Ebola. I think they should be volunteers. God bless everybody that goes over there to try to put an end to Ebola. Our health care workers there, the doctors, the nurses that are the experts of the world from the United States have been contracting Ebola even though they know the best ways to protect from it. I am not convinced that we know how to do that well enough to send troops over there. And who would say that out of 4,000 that will eventually arrive there, and it's 565 today, that they'll all come back and none of them will get be contract Ebola. Here's the protection that they say. We're living in hotels, and the next room next to me will be Liberians, and that one it might be Liberians, American soldiers in this room, scattered out among the Liberians in a hotel, and their protection is, that, and this is the article that says that the, their protection is they don't get to shake hands, and sometimes they get to wipe their feet on a chlorine map. Uh, on a chlorine map. That's not enough. As a soldier, I understand that you volunteer when you raise your right hand and you're willing to sacrifice everything for this country. Soldiers follow orders. This is a job that needs to be done. That's why Congressman King never volunteered for the military. Would you like to respond, Congressman? I think that um, this judgment to do this debate um, will speak for itself. And what do you mean by that? Elaborate. I decided not to do that, Dean. You decided not to what? Not to elaborate on my response. Okay. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay. Again, I, let, me, let me clarify my comment. Soldiers volunteer. Congressman King doesn't understand that because he's not a veteran, and that's fine. But, but <clears throat> veterans understand that soldiers follow orders. This is a job that needs to be done. 
and we follow orders. Well, what did you mean? That's why he didn't volunteer for the I'm, I'm saying he doesn't understand because he never served in the military. Veterans understand that when a job needs to be done, even if it puts your life in danger, you do it. We're willing to sacrifice everything for the future of this country. Soldiers are asked to volunteer when this, uh, to volunteer when it's a suicide mission or when it's a very dangerous mission. You line them up and you say, who wants to go on this? There are plenty of soldiers out there that are willing to volunteer to go fight Ebola. They should be the ones that have the opportunity to go. And, I, and, and when the mothers and the families and the soldiers that are ordered into this place in West Africa into an unseen, unknown enemy, when we can't even tell the public, when we have a Center for Disease Control director who will make a blatant statement one day and two days later it turns out to be wrong, two days later his next statement's wrong, the president's statement's wrong, we can't be ordering people into a scenario like that without telling us how those doctors contracted Ebola. We're not getting honest answers from our commander in chief and he's the top military officer in the United States I of don't America. Think anyone, we understand, Congressman, uh, the point that you're making on Ebola. I want to go back, though, to a statement that you made about Congressman King not having served in the military. Is that, are you making that a relevant point in I, this I'm campaign? Po I'm pointing out factually that he doesn't understand what soldiers and veterans have been through. And that's okay. That's not part of his record. I'm pointing out that as a veteran, I understand that when you volunteer for the military, you're willing to sacrifice everything for this country, and you follow dangerous orders. I've spent years in a war zone for my country. So I understand just to, be, just to be clear, you're not saying that he's not a qualified candidate. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because I'm saying that Congressman King does not understand that soldiers volunteer at the beginning when they join the military, and right. that means that you follow orders. Well, and I, so suggesting I, I, that, that soldiers have to agree with orders to follow them is just false, and it, it shows a lack of understanding of military culture. I applaud culture. my opponent for his service in the United States military. God bless you for doing that, Jim, and everybody that put on a uniform to save America. But I'm not convinced that that's not your only qualifier for this job. I, I have a record of saving taxpayers billions of dollars. I've had a top secret security clearance for over a decade doing intelligence work. I've gone line, line by line of the federal budget to save taxpayers billions of dollars. That stands in stark contrast to my opponent's record because the only thing that he's ever accomplished in, in, in this Congress is shutting down the government. Let's try to move on here. Um, we talked about a little bit about Ebola. I'd like to go on to health care now. And, and Mr. Maurer, um, Congressman King has, has made it uh, his mission for the number, a number of years to try to repeal Obamacare. Um, you just said that you have problems with Obamacare. Um, but we've also uh, talked to you about uh, how you, your family, you personally uh, feel that you have benefited from Obamacare. How would your family be affected if it were, repe were repealed? Well, as I said, uh, I've got a lot of problems with the Affordable Care Act. I think it's been very clear from the beginning that there were things that were not working. Um, when Such you look as. at uh, doctor relicensing, taking doctors away from times with patients to go through relicensing procedures uh, and other mechanisms, uh, I don't think of the right approach. Um, but I, I think we need to fix this. We need representatives who care deeply about our health care system and making sure that people get the care they need. And Congressman King has voted to put the insurance companies back in charge, to take away health insurance from people with re pre-existing conditions, like my son, as you stated. Uh, he's voted to allow insurance companies to charge women more than men. Uh, and that's the stark contrast that exists. Do you take that personally? Well, look, this is where public policy intersects people's lives. Uh, my youngest son has a serious pre-existing condition with no treatment and no, no cure. And if we went back to a time when people with pre-existing conditions could be thrown off their health insurance, that would be bad for my family. And Congressman King, um, if you're successful in repealing Obamacare, what, what is your answer for families like Jim Mowers who right now are relying on the law to deal with pre-existing conditions? Start, let's start there. Okay. It um, seems to me that there have been a lot of DCCC opposition research done on my record, and it surprises me they didn't get back to my time in the state senate when we established Hawkeye, uh, which is health insurance for children in this state. Uh, and, and by all measures that I can uncover, Mr. Maurer's children would be qualified for Hawkeye, and so that exists, along with a high-risk pool that we established, and we buy down the premiums for those with pre-existing conditions with state taxpayer dollars. I chaired the Iowa Senate State Government Committee that managed that program and that fund. But the important thing for people to remember is Obamacare is a disaster. It is a, it is a usurpation of our God-given right to manage our own health. 
It is a federal takeover of our skin and everything inside it and forever takes away from us the ability to make our own health care decisions and commands us to buy policies that are approved and eventually produced by the federal government. So if we repeal all of it, we get our freedom back. The next thing we do is we get back the things that were taken from us that were promised it would not be like our doctors, our insurance company, and in premiums have gone up for almost everybody in the United States of America, including me. I paid 28% of my health insurance premium before the bill passed. Now I pay 47%. It was an additional cost after tax, out of, out of pocket, $4,400 a year is my Obama increase. So being without it is a lot better. If the next Congress uh, fails to repeal Obamacare, um, what would your fallback position be? What, what comes next? And how long are you willing to fight to repeal Obamacare? I'll put the repeal on the next president's desk then, and I look forward to January 20th, 2000, 2017, when we elect a new president who will sign the repeal of Obamacare. And I want to be there on the west portico of the Capitol when that happens. Well, that's fine, but we need to govern for the next two years. Congressman King wants to wait. This country can't wait. We need to get something done in Washington. And he is saying he's an obstructionist. He said that before. He wishes he was a better obstructionist. And he wishes there were more obstructionists like him in Congress. Okay. I wish I had killed Obamacare when I had the chance to do so, and I'll keep trying. Go ahead. Okay. Let's talk about something that happened to our neighbors to the north. Canada's prime minister has said they had an, an act of terrorism on their own soil. What should be the response to ISIS? And if you would go back in Congress, you were saying Congress should come back, have a debate, and a vote on what U.S. intervention in the Middle East should be. Mm -hmm. well, how would you vote, and what do you want to see in the plan? Well, I, I supported the, the um, Buck McKeon amendment in the, in the previous appropriations that we did. The president asked for $500 million to train the Free Syrian Army, send them off for a year and train them and send, send, send 5,000 back. I'm not particularly optimistic about that. I would, I would empower the Kurds. I'd give them all the heavy weapons that they can use. I would put our special forces on the ground and call in special, close air support. I would do all those things. but. For the President of the United States, and I will disagree with a good number of our, my Republican colleagues, I believe he has the legal authority to intervene against ISIS in that part of the world under the 2001 and the 2002 Status of Forces Agreement that were passed by Congress. But I think he should come back to Congress to refresh the authorization for use of military force so that he has the full support of the Congress and the people of the United States of America to defeat this enemy that the President says he wants to destroy and degrade. I think you add the word defeat to that and we should go forward. Mr. Maurer, you've raised some concerns about, concerns about arming the rebels in Syria. Why? Well, first of all, Congressman King's answer shows that he has a complete lack of understanding of what's happening on the ground. He doesn't understand the region. And that's okay. Again, I've spent years on the ground in Iraq doing intelligence work as well. Um, the Muslim, the Sunni Muslim rebels in Syria are the same extremist groups that we were fighting in Iraq. Uh, that I was fighting there with the Iowa National Guard in 2006 and 2007. And now the Obama King plan to arm these Sunni Muslim rebels in Syria uh, is exactly the wrong approach. The CIA has produced a report saying it's not the right approach, it's not going to work. Um, and, uh, you know, again, talking about arming the Kurds, that may be the right approach. However, again, Congressman King doesn't understand the complexity. Our NATO ally in Turkey is in conflict with the Kurds. We have to be on a full diplomatic offensive before we can make that step. Congressman King. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody say the Obama King plan. I mean, this has gone into Never Never Land here in this debate. It's completely ridiculous. And uh, the gentleman has been in Iraq. And I said again, God bless you for serving there, Jim. But I've been all over that place, too, and I've looked Erdogan in the eye in Turkey. I've listened to his tirade. I've met with the Kurds as recently as the last three and a half weeks or so. I'll be back there again before Thanksgiving. I've been all over that part of the world, and I've met with the leaders. And I will tell you that when I receive briefings from our President of the United States and, excuse me, briefings from his cabinet members, and I'm speaking directly of the Secretary of State and, and also James Clapper, after Benghazi, and we get false statements made in classified briefings, we've got an administration that's awfully hard to fight a war with, and I'm giving the president the one thing he's willing to do, and that's train the Free Syrian Army. Are you prepared to go further in Iraq if it's needed, in the Middle East, in Syria? Yes, and the biggest difficulty is how do we win a war with this president? Let's, let me talk about... Well, so ask Congressman about, King wants to reinvade Iraq, which is exactly the right approach. That's not what I said. We have a said, broad go coalition further, acting against ISIS, uh, and that's the right approach. This cannot be seen as a United States 
versus ISIS. This needs to be a broad international coalition. We've got the, the Saudis and other Sunni country as well uh, leading the offensive. That's the right approach. This is a counterterrorism mission. It requires a counterterrorism approach. Mr. Maurer, the U.S. military forces are at the lowest levels in decades, and because of the 2011 sequest sequestration, um, are expected to go even lower um, if more money is not put into the Pentagon. Um, do you believe that the American military can operate and protect the country at those levels, and what would you do? Well, this is, uh, you know, we were facing these budget cuts when I was at the Pentagon. Uh, they're taking a significant toll, uh, especially as we come out of Iraq and Afghanistan. We need to reset our forces. Uh, we need to shift towards future conflicts. And with the sequester in place, uh, it's not properly resourced to get that job completely done. And so we do need to find a fix to the sequester. We need to realign our forces for the asymmetric threats we face in the future, counterterrorism, a pivot to Asia, and a full cybersecurity offensive. And Mr. King, uh, is, the, is the American military too small right now? Um, or should the automatic cuts be allowed to go into effect? I voted against the sequester. I thought it was a bad bargain to put our military on the auction block along with the bargain to try to cut some other spending. And I don't think we should have done that. I think we should maintain the capability to fight a two-front war, and I think we need to expand the mobility of our military so we can do some of these things to be able to operate in multiple places simultaneously. But the operation going on with, with ISIS in that region where they have created their caliphate that's not just a special operations thing. They, they invaded into Iraq. They invaded the base that you were on. We've got to turn them back. And the people that are capable of doing that that are on the ground now are the Kurds. We and need to help how them. much additional money do you think is needed to bring the forces up to where you think is appropriate? You know, I don't have that number. And one of the difficulties in getting it is to get straight answers out of this administration. But I would work through the committee to arrive at that. And I've long been a supporter of our military and the resources to keep them as effective as they need to be. But do I hear that both of you agree that the cuts in the U.S. military should not be allowed to continue. It took an astute ear to find agreement here, Dean, but you did it. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, we agree on that, yes. Um, many Iowans don't remember, but there was a time when there was not electricity in rural Iowa, and the federal government launched a program to electrify the rural parts of the country. Congressman King, broadband is seen now as a utility that is vital to business interests and to farmers who want to keep mm -hmm. in touch with the markets. Is it time for the federal government to do for broadband what they did for electricity? Well, I, I think here in Iowa, if we, we used to have 142 individual telephone companies, and that was a pretty good measure. They brought a lot of good resources to the table and deployed a lot of, a, a lot of infrastructure. The biggest risk to broadband deployment out here where it needs to go is if the Universal Service Fund is raided by the urban areas in the country. They see the money. They want that money to build out their infrastructure in the urban areas. We need to protect the Universal Service Fund for our rural areas, and we can get broadband out to everybody. Can that pass Congress, though? When you, have, the when you have fewer and fewer rural representatives in it, Congress? It gets more difficult, and, and you need to be ever more aggressive and, and ever more vigilant. And while I have the opportunity to say so, I appreciate the input co that comes from our local telcos that keep me hopefully on top of this and my staff on top of it. How do you extend broadband service to rural areas of the state that don't have it right now? Well, we have to invest in our infrastructure, and that means investing in roads and bridges and schools. Investing in infrastructure is great for the rural economy. Investing in broadband internet access, investing in smart grid technology, that's the path forward. When the greatest generation came home from war, they invested in the future of this country. And that's our inheritance is uh, the greatest nation on earth. I'm and Congressman King has an ideological conflict with investing in the future of this country. A lot of my campaign is based on investing in our infrastructure, including a bill that's in the House that has 30 Republican and 30 Democratic co-sponsors. Congressman King uh, opposes investing in any way in our future. I want to double back uh, to the subject of Ebola just for a second, because within, since we maybe even started this debate, the news has broken that another case of Ebola is reported in the United States now in New York City. Does that at all, Congressman King, change the mind that you have on how we fight Ebola in that more money ought to be given to the National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and maybe they have been underfunded. That's my statement. In the, uh, but does this change your mind? 
Well, Dean, of course, you know I'm going to start out the answer with a lot of people drove, drove here on a four-lane Highway 20 that I have supported for 20 years, and we're going to get that connected to Sioux City. And now to your question, um, and that is we have increased the funding into the Center for Disease Control significantly each of the past five or six years at least. It wasn't because of lack of funding that we got Ebola into this country. It was due to the lack of vigilance. And so let's first put, a, put some pieces in place that can protect us from Ebola. We don't need to have flights coming to the United States with passengers on them that originate in, in the Ebola-infected countries. Uh, that's the that's first one. Second is we need TSA to set up a no-fly list. They can put that into their computer system and keep people off the planes uh, that, that are coming from those kind of areas. <coughs> then we need to have a director of the Center for Disease Control that we can believe. I think it's time for Tom Frieden to step down. I think his intentions were good, but I think he no longer has the credibility. And then chase down each thread of Ebola and, and be able to do the quarantine <coughs> so we can stop that disease in this country. It isn't a matter of spending money down at the Center for Disease Control as much as it is getting a containment on the issues that we have here. Mr. Mauer. Uh, all I hear, heard there again was fear and fear mongering. Our medical experts, our transportation experts have told us that thus far this isn't the right approach. And so we need to react again calmly, deliberately, and we need to invest in our CDC and our NIH over the past decade, while Congressman King has been in Congress, NIH's real funding has dropped significantly. Let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. Are, are you saying that as cases, more cases are reported here, that we're doing just fine with the system that we have is going to contain it? No, we need to invest in it. And again, we would be in a much better position if funding to these areas had not been cut. <coughs> if you look back at the government shutdown that Congressman King uh, led, for two weeks, the NIH was shut down. Our researchers and our scientists were sent home, experiments were lost, and their funding has been cut. That puts us in a weaker position to respond. That's why we need to invest in those areas. Dean, I voted twice to keep the government open, September 20th and September 28th. It was the president that shut the government down. <laughs> I said I'm not going to fund Obamacare, and we funded everything except Obamacare. And I went to open the government up. I physically opened the government up. I went down to our mall where the president had taken people off of furlough and leased barricades and said it's essential services to keep our veterans out of the World War II Memorial, out of the Lincoln Memorial, out of Korea, and, and, and out of the Vietnam Wall. I cut the ribbon. I swung the barricades open. I opened up the government when the president had shut it well, down. Well, Congressman King did not tell those veterans is that he put the barricades in place. He's okay. the one who led the shutdown. The day the government <laughs> shutdown began, he said it was the best day that he'd had in Washington. The day the government shutdown ended, he said he was very we're, disappointed because he wanted to, to keep it going. All right, we're, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to just ask you a quick question about the role of government, uh, Mr. King. Um, are there any aspects of American society where you see the free market does not work um, and that there should be government intervention? Well, that's a good question. Our military, for sure, uh, is a place where the free market doesn't work. That's what we do best to defend any, our country and our other shores. places? I imagine I can think of a few. Carrying the mail would be another one. Transportation would be another one. Education for competition purposes would be another one. Research and development when the private industry doesn't drive it, that's another one. So there are multiple places out there where the private sector doesn't drive enough capital into something that we actually need. What about the Manhattan Project? I and mean, would we have won World War II without that? So it's, this country is full of things that government does, does well, and was necessary for the survival and the preeminence of the United States of America. And Mr. Maurer, are there things that the government is doing right now that would be better off being done by the private sector? Well, we have a capitalism society. Uh, capitalism is the best uh, uh, economy in the world. That's why we're the greatest nation on earth. And so we have to con be continuously working hard uh, to look at what our government is doing. Uh, if you look at the unintended consequences at times of legislation that's been passed and an undue area, burden. Though, that would be better off privatized? Can you think of one? Well, uh, again, I think if you look at the EPA permitting processes that exist, there are some areas there that need to be reformed so that they're not uh, unduly burdensome. Some regulations on small businesses uh, as well need to be cut. Uh, Mr. Maurer, Congressman King supports construction of the XL pipeline. Do you? I do. Um, Congressman King, there are people who live in northwest Iowa who are concerned about this transmission line that will take wind energy from northwest Iowa to Chicago. Do you think that line should be built? I, I, yes, I do, and, and I have a concern, and that is that we respect the property rights along the way. So I'd say to the proponents of it that are investing the capital and putting the plan together, 
go sell this, get the leases that you can, put, the, put, the, put your money down on the table to secure by negotiation the maximum number of leases, and let's not go down with eminent domain unless it's absolutely necessary and if there's a consensus that's established by existing leases, those created leases, I should say, rather than existing. Congressman King, uh, same-sex marriage is now the law in the land in 32 out of the states of, of the America. Is, uh, is that... Uh, is there any possibility of rolling that back now? Well, I think, Kathy, we know each other, but I think that's a bit of a loose use of the law of the land. Uh, four and a half percent of the people in this country have voted in favor of same-sex marriage, and the balance of that is judge-made law. And uh, so you've seen the but pattern it, but here But it in is, Iowa. in fact, uh, people are allowed to marry um, regardless of sex in 32 states. Can it be rolled back? You know, I don't know. Um, you know. We voted three state Supreme Court justices off the bench primarily because they made a bad legal decision. And, and so here's what I want to see. I want to see the voice of the people. I want to see it reflected in the legislatures across this land. If it's the people's decision, I'll support the people's decision. But if it's, if it's judge-made law that's not based on constitutional law, and I have read these decisions, yeah. by the way, then I don't support Mr. that. Mr. Maurer, would you do anything to protect uh, religious institutions and people who uh, are uh, concerned about uh, their own morality from being forced to recognize or uh, aid same-sex marriages if they don't wish to do so? Well, we have a, a freedom of religion here in this country that needs to be protected uh, very carefully. And so imposing any kind of requirements on religious institutions is something that I would fight against. What about private businesses? Uh, I think that's an equal protection issue. Uh, everyone deserves equal protection under the law, and all citizens are required to recognize that. We have a magic wand, and you have only 15 seconds to answer this <laughs> each. Um, if you could wave the wand, which tax would you get rid of, Congressman King? All of the federal income taxes that are out there, and I'd replace it with the fair tax, and that would be a national consumption tax on personal consumption. <laughs> And it would do everything good that anybody's tax policy does that is good. It would do them all, and it would do them all better. H.R. 25. Mr. Maurer? Well, I think we can lower effective tax rates if we eliminate loopholes for billionaires, for corporations, et cetera. Congressman King's plan for a 35 percent across the board tax not, uh, has been laughed out of the room by economists and policymakers. It would be the most regressive tax in American history. It would be the largest tax cut for the wealthy and the largest tax increase for the middle class. Mr. Maurer, Congressman, Maurer, Congressman King. What is your priority for the next term? Yeah, and you only have a few, uh, 15 seconds. I think the most important thing we can do here in Iowa is have the leadership that will help bring forward the best possible president of the United States who will carry with him or her the planks Maurer. of the platform to go to the White House. Yours? Well, I'm actually going to go to Congress and get something done, which is pass a minimum wage, wage increase to give 300,000 working Iowans a pay raise. I believe there's dignity in work, and if you work 40 hours a week, you shouldn't live in poverty. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Thanks, well, it takes a lot of talented people and truckloads of equipment, you might imagine, to accomplish what you've just seen on your behalf. So for IPTV's friends who support it and the entire Iowa Public Television crew, live from Storm Lake and Buena Vista University's Anderson Auditorium, I'm Dean Borg. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Iowa banks know you want honest advice about how to best reach your financial goals, whether it's financing and education, buying a new home, growing a business, or funding retirement. Iowa banks, Iowa values. MyIowaBank.com. The Rotary Clubs of Iowa and Rotary International. In 1985, Rotary International committed to a goal of ending polio worldwide. Very soon now, after immunizing over 2 billion children, the goal will be achieved. Rotary, humanity in motion. Alliant Energy, working to help Iowa small businesses become more profitable with energy efficient heating, cooling, lighting, and more. Information is available at AlliantEnergy.com. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, 
the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users.